Morning, Dr. Cook. I was told 10, so I'll... No, that's, fine. that's fine. Okay. Oh, that's fine. No, that's no, fine. No, it's no, fine. It's okay, okay. It's fine. It's fine. 10 is good fine. Good evening. I think uh, Dr. Uh, Doug Cock, he's fantastic in the IOL power calculation, so no problems. Good evening, uh, Dr. Doug. Go ahead. You can take 10 minutes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahipal. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. And uh, let me uh, go ahead and share my screen here. And uh, I was asked to talk about IOL calculations and uh, what I call challenging or outlier eyes. And pertinent disclosures are listed to the right here. Um, all right. So how good are we in doing our calculations? In normal eyes, most of us are about 80% within a half diopter of target. The best data I've seen come from Abelafia in a paper that he published recently, 92% within a half diopter. And I think that's the goal to which we all aspire. But there are a group of eyes for whom that doesn't work. Uh, and we still are still challenged. The sources of error today are the, of course, the calculation of the effective lens position, measuring the corneal anterior curvature, posterior curvature, and uh, then of course the refraction. So the one challenging group are short eyes, and I think they're among our most difficult. And if you look at a paper we wrote, we got less than 80% within a half diopter uh, of target with the, the best formula being the holiday. And that's borne out by other studies in the literature. Um, this is a patient of mine who was a hyperope with a short eye with a shallow anterior chamber, thick lens, normal corneal diameter. And uh, when I picked, these are the three formulas I used with a 28 diopter eye well, that's what they predicted and she ended up minus two and she ended up the same for the fellow eye. So the short eyes can be surprised. And I think it's important that we warn our patients of that. And the problem of course is the ELP with a high powered eye well, a small shift induces a big refractive change. For uh, second eye adjustments in these kind of eyes, the old rule is you adjusted 50% of the error for the first eye, but in these short eyes, if the anatomy is the same, I adjust them a full amount of the error from the other eye. What about nanophthalmos, which of course is an extreme version. And I, to me, this really is talking about eyes less than 18 millimeters. Um, first of all, the IOLs calculations are unpredictable. This is a study from Kane reporting various formulas in patients who really weren't that short, 1886 to 2245. And you can see that they're well below even 60% within a half diopter of target. And it's even uh, in nanophthalmos, of course, where we require very high powered eye wells. The formulas can be off by a diopter, five diopters or more. Uh, in the US, we're limited to a 40 diopter foldable and then a uh, 45 diopter one piece PMMA with a 5.5 optic. I think in India, you probably have access to the uh, some models that go up to even higher levels, probably with hydrophilic models um, from human optics and Zeiss, I know, makes them. Uh, so the options when you have a patient like that are to put the 40 diopter in and then correct the remainder with glasses or contacts. You can special order the lens. Uh, I don't recommend a piggyback eye well because of the crowded anterior segment in these eyes. I think if you can avoid it, that's a, a wise choice. This is a patient in whom I did piggyback eye well. She has a 40 diopter in the bag and a 12 diopter in the sulcus. First eye did well. Second eye, 12 diopter, different model in the sulcus. And what do you see? Well, it actually, the entire haptic eroded through where the uh, uh, iridoplasty had been done using the argon laser. So. I tend to stay away from piggybacks in these patients. You've got to maintain really good anterior chamber depth when you're operating on them. Mannitol, all the standard things we do. Be very cautious about vitrectomy. The anatomy of the, of the aura is, is uncertain in these short eyes. And if you do a vitrectomy later on in the case, it can exacerbate a choroidal effusion. Operating, you never let the chamber shallow. A shallow chamber predisposes to choroidal thickening. You want to maintain the anterior chamber depth at all times. Injecting viscoadactive uh, AD, OVD can be helpful. Um, and as you exit the eye, always refill with an OVD, BSS, or even air so that the chamber never shallows. And so if you're operating on these eyes and the posterior pressure increases, what should you do? Should you abort the procedure? Never a bad idea. You could try more mannitol. Scleral windows are very successful in our hands. Pars plantar vitreous removal, as I said, not a good idea because if there is an effusion, it could actually make it worse. 
managing the choroid is, is thick is critical in these eyes. If you and it, I'm, it, this goes in with a talk on eye well calculations because if you manage the choroid, the eye well will sit in the eye where you predict it to be because uh, it, the uh, anti the posterior pressure won't push it forward. And so the, the way to do that, of course, is to make a scleral window. And you can do it either with a, a single slit, as you will see me do in this case, um, or you can do a, a scleral flap and do a very thin scleral flap and either make it so thin that that's the window or actually use a Kelly punch. Uh, here I am with my colleague, Peter Chang, in a 15.75 millimeter eye, making a, a, a scleral window. And you can see how thick the sclera is. And it really takes a lot of force with a Kelly punch to make a punch in these. And with that, in this patient, the surgery went well. Um, and then post-op, you gotta be prepared for intractable posterior pressure and a shallow ACD post-operatively. Um, malignant glaucoma can occur in these eyes with a shallow anterior chamber with increased pressure, but not always increased pressure caused by choroidal expansion or effusion. In the management, you can try atropine, uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors or YAG laser to the hyaloid face, or you can do an iridozonular hyaloidectomy, as you see my colleague Lauren Bleeding, Bleeding doing here to create a unicameral eye. So I'm gonna skip over this and go to uh, the fact that we're doing much better with long eyes. It started with our Wang Coke modification, which we found to be very accurate in a study of 1600 eyes. We were 93% within a half diopter. Fortunately, we have other good options now, the Hill RVF3, the Barrett, Kane, and Olson. And we're doing better with long eyes because it's a low power eye well. So the effective lens position, if it's not where it's predicted, it has much less impact on outcome. Well, let's, let's uh, go to two other topics briefly, the post LASIK eye. Well, I mentioned the three so main sources of error. These are all magnified in the post LASIK eye the ELP problem, because there's the problem with formulas that use corneal power to calculate the ELP. Corneal measurements are problematic because of the greater variability of the anterior cornea and the uncertain accuracy of the posterior cornea. And of course, refraction has soft endpoints in these patients. Ideally, we really want these patients to be 90% within a half diopter of target, but if you look at the literature, there's one small study that's 85%, but every other one is less than 73%. We find the Barrett and the Masca to be the best ones in our hands. Um, if we look at, that was myopic LASIK and hyperopic LASIK. The best um, is a paper out of the, the Netherlands with 73% with the Barrett True K. Our results with this formula, 57%. So we had hoped that measuring the posterior cornea directly rather than predicting it would give, bring us greater accuracy. We studied that using the standard HIGAS formula with total keratometry from the IL Master 700, less than 75% within a half diopter of target for myopic, hyperopic LASIK and RKIs. And um, Michael Lawless and Graham Barrett published a paper uh, looking at the Barrett True K with the IL Master 700 TK, still only 72% within a half diopter of target. What about aura? Well, you know, it does take into account the posterior cornea, but we actually found it doesn't really help us be more accurate. But we are very meticulous in our calculations. We even do use the, the Avanti OCT. So for some surgeons, aura may still be helpful. And I think if there's a ceiling to the accuracy of aura because it still needs to calculate and predict the effective lens position, but it's on an eye that's already been altered by surgery. Final topic, keratoconus. That's a big challenge. And these are data from my colleague, Samitra Candlewall and our, our group and two other groups, as you see there. And this is along the Y, the X axis, the mean corneal power. And this is the refractive prediction error. This is the holiday one, but it could be for any of the formulas. And you can see that the regression line has an R squared of about 0.42, which is quite good up to about 50 diopters. And above that, the, the, the numbers really fall down. Uh, and the R squared is very low. So these are a huge scatter. Now we have new formulas available to us, the Kane and the Barrett, but I think it's really unclear whether they're actually gonna bring us any, any advantages. So in conclusion, we have these groups of eyes that I call outlier eyes. They give us challenges uh, in calculating eye well power. Sometimes the surgery is very challenging and we need to prepare your, our patients and ourselves for unexpected po post-operative refractive errors. 
And that was kind of a whirlwind tour of this topic. And thanks so much for inviting me to speak to this very prestigious meeting. I'm really, really honored to speak to you all.